Hi everyone, I'm Ram Prasad and I'm going to discuss some works on explaining the decision making process of deep networks and how understanding this decision process can help us fix various characteristics of the model. We need interpretability in order to build trust in intelligent systems that we are building and move towards the meaningful integration into our everyday lives. This involves building transparent models that have the ability to explain to us why they predict what they predict. And this transparency and the ability to explain, uh, I think is useful at three different stages of, of AI evolution. First, when an AI is significantly weaker than a human and not readily deployable, for example, visual question answering uh, models, these uh, the goal of transparency and explanations could be to identify the failure modes and thereby help researchers focus their efforts on the most fruitful directions. Second, when an AI is on par with humans and readily deployable, for example, image classification trained on sufficient data, the goal uh, could be to help establish appropriate trust and confidence in end users. And when an AI is good enough and uh, is even better compared to a human, for example, in the game of chess or Go, the goal of explanations could be machine teaching. That is a machine teaching a human about how to make better decisions. So today we'll first look at explaining the decision-making process of deep networks through visual explanations. We we'll look at certain approaches and properties of explanations and uh, look into some insights that we can gain from that. And then we will see how these visual explanations can improve models in several ways. Yeah, let's briefly look at some of the tools that we have for this. The first set of approaches that were introduced were gradient-based methods, such as backpropagation, guided backpropagation, layer-wise relevance propagation, integrated gradients, and gradcam. And there are several more. Uh, and there were works that tried to explain visual, um, explain these models by simplifying the model architecture for example, class activation mapping. Um, and there have been other approaches, so the line of works that consider this model as a black box, for example, line or sharp and so on. Uh, now we look at one of these techniques. Uh, we look at GradCam. So uh, the way GradCam works is given an image, you feed it through the convolution layers of a CNN and you get feature activation maps. These feature activation maps can be used for any task. Let's take the case of image classification, where you have a couple of fully connected layers, fully connected layers post the last convolution layer, and then a final softmax over uh, the set of classes. Let's say the model predicted this image to have a tiger cat. Now, what we want to do is to determine the most important neurons in this last convolutional layer, layer. So we do that by simple sensitivity analysis, where we compute the gradient of um, the score for the class tiger cat with respect to the last convolution layer activations. And we, what we get are each, uh, uh, these gradient maps that are of the same dimension as the forward activation maps. Now, in order to get uh, the importance of individual neurons in this convolutional layer, we do a global average polling here. So if there are 512 neurons in your last convolution layer, you'll have a 512 dimensional vector. And because we want to explain this particular image, we combine these weights with the forward activation maps uh, and then remove the negative values to get GradCam. Here, what you get is a heat map of the same dimension as the last convolution layer feature maps. But now to visualize it, we are the, um, um, extrapolating it uh, to the mid dimension. And then we see that uh, the model seems to be looking at the cat to predict tiger cat. Now you can do this for any task. Say you can take image captioning models where you can have an RNN on top of these last convolution layer maps that give you a prediction like a cat laying on the ground. Or you can have uh, tasks that require additional modalities, such as VQA, and you can explain uh, for a particular question and an answer where the model is looking at. 
So essentially, we can do this for any network that is differentiable post the last convolutional layer, which is the case for most models that we train these days. And we can combine this with uh, other approaches, such as guided backdrop, to get guided radcam, which gives you uh, much more finer detailed visualizations, such as this here, for example, for tiger cat, we can see that the model seems to be relying more on the stripes. Um, yeah. And uh, not only that, you can visualize uh, the model's decision making process. You can even ask the question like, where would you have to look in order to predict the category, the dog category, say boxer? And now you can see that the model seems to be looking at the dog regions. So what are some properties of visual explanations that we care about? Uh, the most important property um, could be the faithfulness. So essentially, we want to know how faithful is the explanation to the underlying model. We want these explanations to be understandable to humans. So interpretability is another important characteristic. Humans have to be able to easily understand the decision decision and the decision making process. Um, and uh, of course, these explanations should be uh, pretty easy to get, like uh, the cost of getting the explanations should be pretty low. So these explanations should be inexpensive to compute. And then require uh, the model, uh, you don't have to retrain the model or change the model parameters to explain the model. So essentially you want the explanation technique to not cause any changes in the model parameters and uh, hence you uh, thereby uh, maintain the model performance. So uh, now let's look at some of the insights that we can gain through these explanations. So we uh, visualize one of the first deep network based captioning systems. For this image, the model predicted a group of people flying kites on a beach. And uh, you can see that the visualization seems to look at the flying objects and a little bit at the people. And for this image, the model predicted a man is sitting at a table with a pizza. The model seems to be looking at the man and a little bit at the pizza, but not at any evidence suggesting that the person is sitting, indicating that it could be the language model taking over and has hallucinating things. Uh, here is GradCam applied to visual question answering, where the task is given an image and a natural language question asking, what is the person hitting? The model looks at the ball and uses a little bit of the context to answer tennis ball. So we find that even simple non-attention based CNN LSTM models tend to attend to appropriate regions. This indicates that you may not need attention based methods if your model is already strong enough. Um, you can use GradCam to understand the failure modes of uh, networks. For example, in this case, uh, the model predicted this image to be of a card mirror. And now you might wonder why, but if you see the explanation, it looks very much like a card mirror. And um, it, uh, it for the, the grounded category was volcano, and you can visualize, and the model is able to identify the volcano in the image. And for this image, the model predicted this to be a wine snake. And if you try to visualize why, um, the visualization looks very much like a wine snake. But if you try to visualize the ground truth category coil, it looks at the entirety of the coil. So what we find is that even unreasonable predictions sometimes have reasonable explanations. Uh, we have a live demo hosted uh, for a bunch of these tasks at um, gradcam.cloudcv.org. Feel free to check that out. People have extended Gradcam to text-based problems such as sentiment classification to show which words are responsible for predicting a positive sentiment and which one might indicate negative sentiment. Um, here's Gradcam extended for video tasks. Here, the class uh, is uncovering something. Here, you can notice that the model seems to be already focusing on, um, on, the, on the regions that can be uncovered. 
And here is uh, the model uh, visualization for the class pushing something. And you can see as the person's hand approaches, you can see the possible areas where the person's hand could touch being highlighted even before the person, person touches them. Um, we have uh, also extended GradCam to uh, go beyond CNN architectures. We extended GradCam to multimodal transformer-based architectures as well. So this was in our uh, recent Europe's paper where we introduced the vision and language pre-training framework. Uh, and uh, here are some results from that. Um, here, the caption is a little girl holding a kitten next to a blue fence. And you can see that for the word girl, the model seems to be looking at the face of the girl. Here, for the, uh, for the word holding, it seems to be looking at the, um, at the kitten that she's holding. And then interestingly, for the uh, word next, the model already seems to be looking at, uh, at the regions around uh, this girl um, and so on. Here for uh, visual question answering, is this a noodle soup? The model seems to be looking, is this a rice noodle soup? The model seems to be looking at the rice here. And uh, here, what is to the right of the soup? Chopsticks, and uh, it looks at the chopsticks right here. What is the man doing in the street? Uh, for, the, for the answer walking, interestingly, it looks at the man, and more interestingly, it looks at the leg of the man, um, and so on. So uh, I would like to think that we are still in the first regime where humans are still worse than AI. And uh, now let's see how explanations can help improve various aspects of these models. Yeah, so um, in the first work, we are going to talk about how these uh, the insights that we gain from explanations can be used to overcome the gender bias. So this work was called Women Also Snowboard, Overcoming Bias and Image Captioning Models. This was presented at ECCV 2018. So here, um, so we have uh, an image where the baseline model predicted this, uh, this is an image captioning model. The baseline model, um, uh, model predicted this to be a man sitting at a desk with a laptop computer. And what was shown here is the, a uh, GradCam visualization for uh, the word man. And uh, you can notice a couple of things that are incorrect here. First thing, the gender of the person is woman. It got the gender wrong. And second thing, it predicted man. And if we were visualizing where um, the model is looking at to predict the word man, it seems to be looking at the computer. So clearly, um, like, but uh, clearly this is wrong. And now what do we actually expect models to do? We would want the model to predict the correct gender. For example, a woman sitting in front of a laptop computer, but also the more we want the model to be looking at the woman when predicting the word woman. So we can say that this model that we want is right for the right reasons. So I think it's important to look into reasons uh, why our model might be making certain predictions because sometimes you can be correct but also be correct for the wrong reasons. For example, here, the baseline model predicted this to be a man holding a tennis racket on a tennis court. Uh, the caption metrics would all give you a good score, but um, here uh, when visualizing for the word man, you can see that it uh, notices the uh, racket more than the man. So indicating that this could be learning some kind of correlation here. Again, here this model uh, seems to be right, but for the wrong reasons. But ideally we want models that uh, look at the, ten uh, at the man when predicting the word man. Uh, so models, we want them to be right for the right reasons. So in this paper, they introduced um, like a model called the equalizer model. Um, so they build the equalizer model by just taking a generic image captioning system. They would take the image and feed it through the CNN to generate uh, words through an LSTM and then they train this with a regular cross entropy loss. 
Um, and here, uh, for understanding the gender error, they want to make sure that when predicting the word man, the model is confident. And uh, this encourages that when the gender evidence is present, uh, the model should be confident in predicting the word, the gender. But we can uh, we can also create images where the gender evidence is absent. For example, you can take the training set and remove, um, like block the regions of the person. And now, um, the uh, and you can train this the same way. But when predicting the word man, we uh, so the, basically when predicting the gender of the person, this model should be confused. Um, and uh, so they add this thing called an appearance confusion loss. So essentially this loss would encourage the model uh, to be confused uh, in order to predict the gender of the person when the gender evidence is absent. So this kind of model seems to be doing a much better job. Um, so here the baseline model predicted this to be a woman holding a cat in her arms and the uh, grad visualization for the word woman looks uh, at the cat, but now the, the model looks at the man, uh, the predicts the man and is now looking at the man. And um, here, uh, here's an interesting example where the baseline model predicted this to be a man sitting on a couch with a laptop computer, but as you can see, uh, there is no gender evidence here. And uh, so the equalizer model now predicts a person laying on a bed with a laptop. So you can see that it is resolving to a, a generic word when the gender evidence is absent. So this is one way where we can just use the insights from explanations uh, to add additional losses to your model to make them uh, right for the right reasons. Now we look at how explanations can facilitate knowledge transfer between humans and AI. So this was ECC 2018 work called Choose Your Neuron, Incorporating Domain Knowledge Through Neuron Importance. So what we're asking is, um, can interpretability help us make networks that generalize better? So essentially, can knowing what the network has already learned help us make it generalize better. In this work, we um, are test bed of zero-shot learning. So where you have a bunch of scene classes, essentially you have images, you have uh, associated class names, and, um, and you also have uh, a list of um, descriptions about a class, say attributes or Wikipedia articles or captions or so on. And you have unseen classes where you only have access to external class information. For example, you uh, you don't have any images of this uh, class of these classes, uh, but you you know what these classes represent. Like, uh, what does these classes mean? You have a shared attribute space, or captions, or Wikipedia articles about these classes. So the task is gen to generalize um, uh, the classification network to go from seen classes and give you uh, um, parameters for unseen classes. So, um, so we call this approach neuron importance aware weight transfer. The idea is pretty simple. So you have an image and you have, uh, you have your Let's say you've trained your um, uh, classifier for uh, the scene classes for which you had images and associated labels. Now you can, uh, for each of these uh, classes, you can compute neuron importance scores. So these neuron importance scores uh, might be uh, something like this. For example, you predict that Neuron number three in the last convolution layer is positively important for this particular class, which means that existence of this 
uh, high activation for neuron three indicates the presence of the oplate class. And here, uh, for example, neuron number 38 could be negatively important, meaning a high value for neuron number 38 might indicate a lower uh, score, like uh, the non existence or an absence of the class, and so on. Now, you can learn to map these neuron important scores to domain knowledge. The, uh, so you can just learn a simple linear mapping. Let's say you have, you know, that Oclet has orange will, multicolored wings, black wings, uh, multicolored is multicolored, uh, has black wings, and so on. You can map these neuron important scores to domain knowledge. Note that these neuron important scores are human interpretable because they are coming from the last convolutional layers, which uh, which look at more semantic concepts. Uh, in the image, and uh, this domain knowledge is also human interpretable, and so it's easier to get this mapping done. And now that you um, have these um, weights for these uh, seen classes, and now we want to uh, get the weights for these unseen classes. So what we do is, let's say an expert comes and says that this is a new class, which is hornbill. It has a long bill, white breast, yellow neck, and so on. Now we can use the mapping that we learned earlier to go from um, this expert knowledge, this domain knowledge, to neuron importance scores. Now uh, you can compute the neuron importance scores for this new class hornbill with respect to the um, to this untrained uh, subnetwork. So essentially, the way you do it is by computing the gradient of the class Hornbill with respect to the last convolution layer to get this ranking. So essentially, uh, since these last parameters, last layer neurons are um, initialized randomly, you don't have uh, so, so this the neuron importances that you get here are going to be random. Now, um, so we have an alignment class here that encourages these neuron importances to match. Um, so basically the predicted neuron importances to match the ones that are coming from the network. So by doing this, um, what we uh, are training are these last layer neurons. So essentially we're learning uh, an unseen uh, head classifier weights with all the new classes or the new unseen classes. So here, what this kind of an approach will give you is uh, not only a way to get visual explanations, but also textual explanation because you have a way to map individual neurons to text um, and then also understand uh, where these top scoring neurons are looking at and uh, get much more detailed visualizations. Yeah, here uh, we look at a work um, that uses explanations to improve the localization ability of models. This work is, tell me where to look, guided attention inference network. So uh, people have uh, observed uh, some issues with attention maps. Attention maps only cover uh, small and the most discriminative regions uh, of the object of interest. For example, here, given an image of a cat, it mostly only looks at the face of the cat because that's the most discriminative region. Um, but uh, you can, uh, like for the class, of, for the case of localization, you might say that uh, this is quite incomplete. In some cases, these networks might focus on the wrong regions due to the data set bias that exists in the training set. For example, uh, the model might be predicting that this image is a boat um, and, and so looking at the water. Um, so in those cases, uh, if you can fix these models through some kind of an external supervision, you might be able to get models that are right for the right reasons. So um, their approach again, uh, essentially uh, tries to um, improve these attention maps. So what they do is that given an image, 
and uh, they um, uh, train the network and then uh, use GradCam to understand which regions the model is looking at. And they block this region and make the model uh, uh, get to find other evidence for predicting the same class. So essentially, when you do this iteratively, you'll now get uh, all the regions that are helpful for predicting this particular class. So essentially, uh, they find that this kind of thing uh, improves the attention and makes it more complete. And in some cases, when you have um, some kind of a human supervision, you can pro you can simply pro add a loss here uh, between the attention map and the pixel level labels that you might have. Um, and then uh, that way make these models much more uh, localized, make these attention maps much more localized. Um, and they found that uh, their approach results in uh, the visualizations being much more complete. Yeah. So um, we'll now look at how we can use explanations to transfer knowledge across domains. This um, is this work is called attention bridging network for knowledge transfer. So here, um, so the domains that they, this paper considers is um, a source domain which only contains single label images, and target domain which contain multi label images. So for the single label domain, uh, single label images from the source domain. Uh, these are mostly images, uh, very iconic uh, images with, uh, 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 with a white background. So the simple saliency would give you all the regions that are important here. So what this paper does is to use a discriminative network and two streams of the classification network. And um, so uh, they share these share the weights between the source domain uh, and the target domain. And um, uh, for these single label images where you have saliency maps, they add additional constraints to the to the GradCam map here. And that way they show that um, uh, when you add this with some uh, adversarial learning, they're able to transfer knowledge from source domain to target domains much more efficiently. Yeah. And they showed that uh, this kind of thing also results in models looking at more complete regions, even in, uh, even in target domains, which have multiple categories occurring. Now let's look at some works that use explanations to tackle distribution shift. So this work is taking a hint, leveraging explanations to improve grounding in vision and language models. Uh, many vision and language models have this problem of using statistical correlations in the training data to arrive at decisions. For example, here, uh, given this image, the model might most likely predict this to be a giraffe standing next to a tree. And this could be because uh, most images in the training set have uh, giraffes co-occurring with a tree. And in VQA, models might predict uh, yellow for the question, what color are bananas, even though these are, uh, these are green bananas, because most images in the training set could be a model, um, there could be bananas being yellow. So this is even more problematic uh, when distributions change. For example, when your train distribution is different from that of the test distribution, these models that rely on statistical correlations will fail. Uh, so uh, a new split of VQA called the VQACP was introduced um, and uh, where they explicitly changed the distribution between the train and the test set. And they found that models do perform poorly. Um, so in order to understand where humans look when making decisions, this was um, work, uh, earlier work from our lab, uh, where they used, um, where they took images um, and blurred them and asked people questions like, what room is this? And people had to unblur the regions that they think are important 
to answer this particular question. So this is available for a small subset of the BQA dataset. Uh, we introduced this approach called HINT, Human Importance Aware Network Tuning, where uh, the idea is pretty simple. So given an image and a question, you split the image to use a bunch of proposals, um, and then you reason over those proposals to get an answer. For example, in this case, if the model predicted what room is this, uh, and it predicted this to be a kitchen, um, uh, let's say it predicted, incorrectly predicted this to be a dining room, we try to understand for the correct class, where is it localizing? And we find that this model relies on the dining table mode. And now you have human attention as to where humans typically look at when making decisions. And we find that um, adding, uh, adding a loss here that encourages model attention, basically the grad cam, to look similar to that of humans by adding this ranking loss and training these networks, you're essentially uh, uh, fine tuning all these uh, highlighted uh, uh, weights. And uh, this, what this does is it improves um, the model's ability to ground uh, during the training stage. And hence it improves uh, the generalization ability um, even when distributions change. Here, these are results on the VQACP dataset, where we observed about a 7% improvement um, on the performance, basically uh, saying that uh, making models look at regions similar to humans makes them generalize to arbitrary, region, uh, arbitrary distributions better. Um, and we also applied this to image capturing models. Um, and we find that the baseline model, for example, in this case, when predicting toothbrush, uh, looks uh, at the sink as well. But now after applying hint, the model only seems to be looking at the toothbrush. And similarly here, uh, we find that the attention improves quite a bit. Um, so of course there are limitations. So uh, one of the biggest limitations of these kind of works that use visual explanations is because uh, like you might not, uh, it might be very hard to understand in many cases, uh, what, re what about these regions is actually important. For example, here given an image and this um, question, are the man and the woman together? Um, like a human attention might just look at a region between the man and the woman, but it's not clear what about this region is actually important. Basically, we need to know, or uh, we need to have a much more deeper understanding beyond the visual context, uh, especially when answering these complex questions, which we'll look at in the next line of work. So in this work, we are trying to see how explanations can make models reason compositionally. This work is squinting at VQA models, introspecting VQA models with sub-questions. So we design VQA systems to be able to have a meaningful conversation and help us in everyday activities. Uh, like a visually impaired user can come and ask, um, click a picture and ask the question, is the banana ripe enough to eat? The model might say yes. You're like, great. Now, just to confirm, you're asking this question back, uh, is the banana mostly green or yellow? And it says green. Now you're like, okay, it seems to have answered a complicated question about ripeness, but it's failing on simple questions that ask about the color. So what's going on here? Right, so we try to, um, we find that in many cases, models are quite inconsistent. Uh, to understand the extent of this, um, we collected this data set called the VQA Introspect data set. Uh, by, we showed humans an image and a question that requires reasoning and asked them to provide perception-based question answer pairs that are helpful for answering the main reasoning question. For example, for this um, image and the question, is this a keepsake photo? And for the answer, yes. 
people provided these perceptions of questions asking about the black and white photo, uh, the whether the woman is wearing a white veil, um, and uh, the man wearing a gown, and so on. And here is this giraffe at the zoo for the answer yes. People typically tend to uh, ask about the existence of a fence around the giraffe and uh, about the shortness of the grass and so on. Here, does this appear to be an emergency? For the answer yes, people ask about the existence of the ambulances and, um, and about, the, uh, about a lot of people gathered in the middle of the street. And uh, is this a good idea for the rainy day? People ask about the existence of the roof on the vehicle. Um, so uh, what we find is that uh, models, current models uh, are inconsistent about 28% of the times. Basically, 28% uh, of the times the model is right, but for the wrong reasons. So to fix this, we introduce an approach called uh, squint, sub-question importance aware network tuning, uh, where uh, the idea is pretty simple, where you have an image and a reasoning question asking what season is it. Now uh, we uh, get a sub-question that says, is, this, uh, is there a Christmas tree pictured on a cell phone? So we would have expected the model to look at the um, uh, regions corresponding to the second question um, to answer the first question. So I think we have an attention loss here that encourages this behavior. Um, and we want the model to utilize this attention to, uh, to answer the main question and the sub question. Uh, and we find that uh, this kind of thing improves the reasoning ability and also uh, consistency by quite a bit. So this shows that human-like compositional reasoning, reasoning can help machines reason better and be more consistent. So in this extension, extension that we presented at ACL, we introduced the concept of uh, relevant sub-questions and irrelevant sub-questions for answering the main reasoning question. So essentially for the reasoning question, was this taken in the daytime? Uh, we have some questions that say, uh, is the sky bright? We want these models to rely on these sub-questions more than uh, irrelevant sub-questions such as, is the train moving? Uh, and then we introduced a contrast of gradient-based laws and showed that this makes models even more consistent. Here, um, let's look at some work that uh, use explanations to improve the self-supervised representation learning. So this uh, work is called Casting Your Model, Learning to Localize Improved Self-Supervised Representations. This is disappeared in this CVTR. So contrast to SSL aims to learn visual representations from unlabeled images through the task of instance discrimination. So where you have an image, take multiple crops of that image, and then um, uh, do some augmentations and create similarity between them and make them dissimilar to a bunch of random images. And people have observed that uh, the reason progress, um, like reason methods outperform even fully supervised image net pre-training on a bunch of uh, downstream tasks. Uh, but the shortcomings of this is that um, these the success has been largely confined to iconic images, such as ImageNet images. And we find that a direct application to uncurated web or scene level images only shows marginal gains. And we wanted to understand why this was happening. Uh, so we are we analyze contrast of SSL approaches. Um, and uh, we find them to have poor visual grounding ability. In this example, when we use GradCam to understand which regions the model relies on, um, when matching the query and the key crops, the model seems to be looking at the grass regions more than that of the dog, leading us to realize that these models might be relying on low level visual cues or spurious background correlations. 
Even during the crop computation stage, taking random crops from an image may be acceptable for iconic images such as above. But for scene level images such as this, they might receive imperfect supervisory signals, especially when these augmented views contain very different visual concepts. And this discourages semantic understanding. And we, be we, and we believe that this is what leads to diminishing gains on web scale images and the performance regression on like complex scene level images. So to fix this, our first contribution is a semantic alternative to random cropping, where, they, where we devised an intelligent geometric transform for cropping different views from an input image based on area-based constraints from an unsupervised saliency map. This leaves us with two crops that have salient regions common between them and crop-oriented saliency maps, which we can use as supervision. Uh, we now turn to our approach cast, um, contrastive attention supervised fine tuning, uh, where the idea is to make models attend to appropriate salient image regions during contrastive pre-training stage. We show task in the context of MoCo, given an image and its saliency map from deep USPS. Through a saliency constraint cropping strategy, we get a query and a key crop along with crop oriented saliency maps. We pass the query and the key to their representative, uh, respective encoders. The moment of contrastive loss tries to get the query and the key representation closer but farther away from a queue of negatives. With the masked key containing just the salient regions in the key crop, we then compute the gradient of the dot product of the query and the masked key representation with respect to the last convolutional layer of the query encoder to get GradCam. Uh, we obtain, uh, we, we global average pool these gradients and obtain, uh, combine them, and that's what gives us GradCam. As we can see, the model looks at the background regions and not the sheep as we would have liked. So hence, we provide a cosine similarity based attention loss to align the GradCam map with the query aligned saliency map. These two losses are combined to form our cast loss. And this model upon convergence now looks at the sheep when matching the representations of the query and the key image. We find that um, in addition to outperforming MoCo on all tasks, linear and fine tuning, we find that cast pre-training on COCO, which is a 10x smaller dataset, even outperforms ImageNet fully supervised pre-training on the fine tuning tasks. So you can see that uh, we observe significant performance boost on, on these tasks that are shown while using significantly lesser data. Um, we also found that um, the grounding improves significantly to uh, the downstream tasks as well. Note how the ImageNet fully supervised model and the MoCo uses background as well to predict ball player, whereas the cast retrain model only looks at the player. We also find that cast models attend to the whole extent of objects. Um, to test the robustness of cast, we evaluate on the backgrounds challenge dataset, where backgrounds of ImageNet images are replaced with various settings. As can be seen, cast pre-trained models significantly outperform on all these settings. Here's an example. Uh, for this image of a bird, when the background is changed from sky to water, the baseline model changes its prediction to fish whereas cast pre-trained model still predicts bird, indicating its reliance on the foreground regions more, which is what we want. Similarly, when the background of this reptile class is changed to a place where musical instruments typically occur, the prediction of the cast pre-trained model does not change as opposed to MoCo. This indicates that uh, cast makes models resilient to background changes. Now we'll look at uh, work that um, uses explanations to reduce catastrophic forgetting. This work is called Remembering for the Right Reasons, Explanations Reduce Catastrophic Forgetting. 
Uh, so continual learning um, is about learning a sequence of tasks without forgetting the initial task that you were, you you learned. Uh, the hypothesis behind this work is that uh, this catastrophic forgetting that happens is due to an, it's at least in part due to forgetting the original reasoning for the previous prediction. For example, here for a particular task, after a particular task T, let's say the model predicted this to be um, the blackbird and um, there's the initial explanation of the saliency map. Now, after, uh, after it is trained for multiple tasks, in some cases, the model might remember the initial reason, which is what we would want. But in cases where the model actually uh, predicts incorrectly, we find that the model also forgets the reasoning behind its prediction. So people typically use what is called experience replay, where the idea is pretty simple. Uh, it is to just store, in addition, uh, is to store the predictions from the model for a few set of images. Um, in addition to this, um, what uh, the proposed approach does, which is called remembering for the right reasons, they, in addition to the predictions of the model, they also store the uh, explanations. So essentially, they store the reason behind the predictions. And uh, essentially, they add a loss here, a simple L1 loss that encourages the model to not forget the reasoning behind the prediction as it trains for multiple tasks. And uh, they showed that this improves uh, um, future incremental class incremental learning on, on a variety of um, results. So you can see that adding uh, RQ, uh, remembering for right reasons to all these approaches improves the performance. Similarly, here are the results on ImageNet. And uh, here is how, uh, like the explanations that you get from these models. So initially they found that a simple experience replay, uh, like once the model gets incorrect after say task seven, uh, it continues to never be able to recover from that mistake at that particular, after that particular task. But adding uh, R cube, they found that even after the model initial, like say gets it wrong after say a task five, it is still able to recover from that mistake because you now know the reasoning and you can, you can learn better through this kind of a supervision. So yeah, uh, today we looked at um, explaining decision-making process of deep networks and how we can use these explanations to uh, gain insights and fix models through focus feedback. Uh, thank you so much. Have a great ICCV.